Welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work for the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and the Extension at the University of Kentucky and um, we are so glad that you joined us today. Yeah no doubt Renee. Um, another good show. You know our, our thoughts and hearts and prayers go out to all the people that are suffering across the state from some flooding. Um, we've seen some major damage here in Kentucky um, over the last week or so so um, please be safe, you know, um, and, you know, we'll talk a little later about some resources that can help storm damage stuff. But today we're going to be talking about a few interesting topics. We definitely are. Um, one being on uh, snakes. And then we have our ever famous tree, uh, tree of the week. I think it's, I think it's growing. Everybody seems to want, you know, what tree's next? I know, it's cool. <laughs> And then we have Dr. Ellen Crocker coming in and talking a little bit about some pesky plants. Yeah, so so a good show. So folks, as a general reminder, you can interact with us via the chat pod if you're on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we'll respond as soon as possible. So and Matt, if you're available. Yeah, so uh, it, weather's warming up. Uh, so yes. So what does finally. that mean? Yeah. It, it means my email box is going to get full really soon. <laughs> exactly. That's what it means. I know people uh, are going to be seeing some stuff out there. Like they, they are. And um, so today, um, because the weather is getting warm, um, we thought it was probably a good idea to walk us through one of the resources that we have through our forestry extension team here on snakes. And, you know, as weather warms up, these guys are going to be coming out of their hibernacula. And all of a sudden, that means you're going to start seeing them in places you probably don't want to see them. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were joking earlier, right? We were talking about the, the uh, pesky uh, uh, topic that Ellen has. Well, these guys are kind of a good thing to have for pests on the animal side because they help control them. So, you know, and I think well, that's something people don't really think about. It, you know, they see, ooh, snake, I can't deal with that. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's it's hard to uh, make that connection sometimes, especially when you may not be able to move because uh, you're so scared. So yeah. <laughs> it's try to keep it in mind. But um, so what I, I was thinking about doing is uh, basically sharing the website and walking you through the tools that we have there. And uh, if any questions pop up, I'd be glad to answer them. Otherwise, I'll try to explain what you can and can't do with the website. And hopefully that means you don't have to, you know, necessarily um, – worry about what you're seeing because almost all the snakes that we have asked to identify here are, are non-venomous mm -hmm. so uh, very often it's it's not a problem so right. with that so this is the main page uh the launch screen for the website uh and if you google um kentucky snake identification uh or university of kentucky snakes uh web page it, it'll pop up uh under under uh, your search engine is one of the top two the the fish and wildlife um, snake identification resource that they have, um, which is a great resource, but it's a little bit harder to navigate, uh, will pop up as well. Um, but this is the launch screen and, and the way this is organized, um, you know, it really comes down to a couple of different ways of searching for uh, information, probably searching for how to identify the snake that you saw. Um, but we'll walk through it step by step here and we'll start off going, you can actually um, look at what snakes we have uh, in Kentucky. So you can go to snakes of Kentucky, click on it, and it'll list all the snakes that all the native snakes that we have in Kentucky. Um, and the reason I say native snakes is because there are occasions that we have um, exotic snakes that are found within um, towns, especially uh, that are usually escape pets or pets that were let go. Prime example is I, I've gotten several ball pythons, which are completely harmless, but a really popular pet snake. Um, and, you know, for folks that are unfamiliar with them, they are rather large and they look, their head is very triangular shaped. So they look a little bit more like a venomous species. Uh, they're completely harmless, but they do show up every once in a while. They're not on here uh, because they're not a native species. So if you want to just quick look through all the snakes that we have in Kentucky, you can use this as a resource. Now, if you want to narrow it down, um, and most people do really quickly, one of the things you can do is go, okay, was that snake venomous or not? And the easiest way to do that is to click on the venomous uh, tab there and pull up the four species that we have in the state that are, are venomous. Um, you know, we did that whole ID your snake segment and constantly we, we talked about um, you know, the first thing you can say, is this snake dangerous potentially to you? How do you do that? Well, um, we're trying to knock out one of these four or all four of them at the same time uh, to make sure that you're okay. But 
really, we actually have three venomous species, the copperhead, the timber rattlesnake, and the co western cottonmouth, um, or water moccasin, sometimes people call it, um, that are actually ones that people will probably encounter. Um, the pygmy rattlesnake is found in the area close to land between the lakes, but um, there's potentially less than 10 individuals in the entire state, uh, so highly unlikely. And these guys are really small, uh, but they do have the characteristics of a rattlesnake, a rattle on the tail, triangular head, the, the cat eye pupil, the slit, vertical pupil. Um, but use those features like that Hershey kiss and the banding, um, you know, wide at the bottom, narrow at the top, um, the cat eyes, the pupils, um, triangular head to, to help quickly identify that it's venomous or not. And then you can use those, some of those features to look at um, identifying your species, okay? You can also jump to geographic regions and you can look where your county is, okay? And you can choose that county and it'll tell you whether or not that, uh, what group of species are actually found in that area. So I'm gonna jump to west, the Western counties and give an example, because the West actually is um, probably one of the more diverse areas in terms of snakes species, uh, because of the Mississippi Alluvial Valley that's there. Uh, and uh, also you have um, the for major forested section from the land between the lakes. Um, I already mentioned that they have the pygmy rattlesnake there. Um, uh, as one of the venomous species that's not found in the rest of the state. They also have, um, it's kind of on the line there, but they have the uh, Western cottonmouth is really, that's the stronghold for the species. You do see it uh, all the way uh, east to the Green River, but really we don't see it further east than that. Um, so it need, it's really found primarily in Western Kentucky uh, in and around wetlands and river systems. Um, other snakes that are, are found out there that you wouldn't normally see uh, in eastern Kentucky include, you know, the, the red-bellied mud snake, which is a gorgeous snake. Uh, however, it's strongly tied to uh, water features, okay, or immediately adjacent to water features. Um, you get into a couple other um, water snake species, like the Mississippi green water snake, um, that really you're not going to find um, east uh, of, of that region. So, you can quickly jump to a different region if you want for comparison. Uh, so let's just uh, go into the Southeast here. Um, and there's drastically less species found in that region uh, compared to the West. So it can help you narrow things down a little bit, especially if you wanna just search by pictures uh, instead of necessarily by a feature. Um, one of the things that we do is we have this ID your snake function. Um, and to really use this correctly, we have a couple of different um, characteristics on here. Now, before you jump into using this, this function, what I do recommend is looking at the tab that has the snake characteristics on it, because understanding these characteristics will allow you to better use that ID your snake um, tool. Okay, so it goes into things like body shape, whether or not it's slender, moderate, or stocky body. Um, stocky being much more prevalent in, in our venomous species, uh, which is why that's somewhat important. Um, but, you know, if your ultimate goal is to understand what, you know, species you saw, all of these are important to, to know. Head shape is another big characteristic in, in Kentucky that we can use. Um, you know, whether or not it's a rounded head versus a triangular shaped head. Uh, notice that triangular shaped head, we have three pictures there, two of which are non venomous species. So that head shape can be deceiving, but it's one that helps narrow down as you work through the characteristics that, you know, you don't have a round headed venomous species in Kentucky. Now, if we were further south, say in Georgia, you get into coral snakes, that feature goes away in terms of its effectiveness to determine venomous versus non venomous because coral snakes have a more rounded head. Um, and therefore uh, would not allow us to use that for non-venomous or venomous. Pupil shape, which is can, can be hard to use because um, generally you don't want to be close enough to see a pupil if you're still trying to figure out if it's venomous or non-venomous. Uh, but sometimes um, cameras allow you to zoom in at, at, uh, and, and see characteristics you can't see with your naked eye. Um, so it's one that can come in handy if you get a really good picture of the snake. Um, Round pupils uh, are, for Kentucky, are all non-venomous. Vertical pupils are pit vipers, and in Kentucky, that means a venomous species. Mentioned pit vipers, so if they have a pit, then Kentucky, 
that is going to mean venomous species as well. And this kind of shows you where, what that actually means by looking at the picture there. You can see it's a basically a gap opening, a, an, or, an opening right in front of the eye where it's picking up. Um, it's, a, it's a different organ that they use to pick up heat signatures um, to allow them to hunt more efficiently. Other uh, characteristics, and this may come in handy for, for folks if they find a shed skin in their basement or attic, um, you can look at, if it's in good enough shape, you can look at the scale characteristics below the tail, uh, below the vent at the very back end of the tail and look at those arrangements, okay? Um, double versus single will help you and we'll walk through it and what that means here when we use the ID your, your uh, trait tool. Um, or ID your snake tool and, and um, what could mean for you and what was in your house. Uh, it's not gonna tell you the species, but it can tell you whether or not it's venomous or non-venomous. The tail uh, becomes a little bit trickier um, and really it's a um, one that is used in combination with others in, in some instances, uh, but mostly there's two characteristics that stick out. Um, and it's really for the rattlesnake, obviously, with the rattle that's located on the tail, and then the green tip of a copperhead, a juvenile copperhead that they use uh, to attract um, potential prey as a, as a bait. Um, and that's really a uh, year old copperheads or, or younger. Um, and it's a great feature to use if you see a small snake and they have a yellowish greenish tail tip, a couple, like in two, three inches at the end, that is a, you do not want to get near that snake. Um, that's a great, great distinctive feature. Obviously, rattlesnakes make a sound, a rattle sound, but a lot of snakes will make a rattle sound with their tail. It's a defensive um, behavior uh, to try to scare away or, or allow them to um, convey their, their um, at least trying to scare you or let you know that they are feeling threatened uh, and are willing to potentially protect themselves. If you're around snakes enough, you will notice that um, rattles do sound different than just the tail. However, a, a rat snake that's buzzing its tail on a pile of leaves can sound very similar to a rattlesnake uh, buzzing its tail, depending on the substrate it's in. So those are all the characteristics that are there. We try to have pictures associated with them so it's as easily identified as possible. Now, if you go into your ID your snake, you can start putting those in. Um, so you can use that facial pit Characteristics, uh, yes, it has a facial pit, pit apply it, uh, and you know only four snakes will pop up. So this is really working on a yes, no kind of setup in the background. Um, you could put coloring in. A lot of times folks will, will see coloring, uh, not see coloring, um, and you'll be able to um, you know, try to use as many characteristics as possible to narrow down um, as best you can to potential um, culprits uh, or, or species that you saw. So if you use the, the stocky body size, um, it's going to pop up, you know, a different list. Some of these don't necessarily have that true, like a common garter snake, I would not characterize as, st as a stocky snake, but it, you can see individuals that are larger than others. Um, so you have a larger list than potentially could be um, considered stocky, but it's to help, you know, it's some, somewhat, you know, professional biologist versus a uh, person that's not really familiar or potentially very scared of snakes and what they're seeing. It's, it's loosely fitted to help populate as best as we possibly can. Um, so that kind of walks you through most of them. You can use that back coloring belly pattern. You know, belly pattern is going to be a lot more associated with snakes that you either see that are hanging in a tree above you, or you potentially have a dead snake that you are trying to identify. Um, keep in mind uh, that if you pick up a snake, a venomous species that is dead, and that that um, say a rattlesnake, if you try to if you separate a head from a rattlesnake, you should not pick that head of that snake up um, because it can still potentially bite you. Um, just to to keep that in mind. So. That's kind of a very quick overview of um, the snake identification website. We're still trying constantly to improve this. There are features that if you identify certain species um, that you know may uh, be of interest conservation wise. So things, let me see here. Um, so like the scarlet snake, uh, you click on it. Um, this is what I think I saw. 
we have a report a snake function in here and we're collecting information from folks um, whether or not they want to be contacted for certain species uh, that are of interest to us like this one that are really rare or hard to come by and in terms of building basically it's a citizen science function in many ways uh, that we're building a database over time um, a lot of times our on every one of these pages, we usually have multiple pictures of individuals. So if you need information on a, a specific snake, or if you think that you saw this snake, we try to give a couple different views of that snake to help um, better um, inform you know, uh, the person on what they could have seen, give more options, because there's a lot of individual variation sometimes within these species uh, and their color levels, um, especially true with things like rat snakes, uh, black rat snakes. Um, so there are uh, several different pictures. Um, this is also true um, with uh, things like the hognose, the eastern hognose, uh, which I'm going to try to pull up here and give you an um, example. There it is. Um, here, this individual is solidly black. Uh, that is a common pattern in Kentucky. Uh, however, uh, as juveniles, they more often exhibit this this um, more gray brownish checkering. Um, and sometimes that can be held all the way through. Also, these guys are the ones that do the infamous uh, dead playing dead very, very much like a possum, um, poop all over themselves, squirm, quite the actors. Uh, so sometimes you'll get a, you will actually get a good look at their belly uh, and head. Um, but give you an idea of variation. This is another very common pattern seen with this species in the state. So you can have pretty extreme uh, differences in colors. Uh, so we tried to account for that within the website and provide lots of visuals of what you could encounter in Kentucky. All right, with that, I guess I will take any questions um, from folks if they have any um, or suggestions for the website. Uh, we are always open to trying to make things better. Um, you folks probably use it actually more than we do um, or use it more specifically to what you need where we're trying to guess what you may need. Very useful tool, Matt. Thank you for going over that. I know we get lots of calls and questions and images and from folks across the state about what snake is this? What can I do about it? So um, to have that wonderful resource is really nice. And you know, Matt, a lot of people they see a snake, they panic, and the first thing they do is, I need to kill that snake. So explain to us why you shouldn't do that. Well, um, you snakes have a value in our ecosystems, mostly related to controlling pest species. Um, now, pest species, you know, we automatically, the easiest thing to talk about is, you know, our rat snakes are, um, are, many of our venomous snakes are going to con consume things like mice and rats and squirrels, rabbits that can cause damage to, to our house, the, to our gardens, uh, to our crop fields. Um, there is a direct value there. However, there's also this indirect value where um, there's been some research that has shown that the presence of a healthy rattlesnake population also helps limit Lyme disease spread. Mm because mice are the carriers of, uh, play a vital role in that cycle for Lyme disease. So if you have rattlesnakes around that help keep that, um, those mouse populations in control and contained uh, at, at lower levels, then you actually have less circulation of Lyme disease in the landscape. So there's indirect uh, effects and positive impacts of these guys. However, if you have a rattlesnake living under your steps and you have grandkids coming over, you know, you need to know that and, and try to deal with it um, as best you can. We would like to say to take that snake and move it uh, if you can in a safe manner or hire a professional to come in and do it. Uh, however, there's pragmatic solutions necessary at times and I get it. Um, but don't jump to the conclusion that it's venomous and an immediate threat because um, about 99% of the things that we see are all non-venomous when people are asking questions. And unfortunately about a third of those are um, post-mortem. I guess a lot of times too, you know, people, they just naturally think it's a venomous snake because it's a snake, it's venomous. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a snake, it, it only good snakes, a dead snake. Yeah, and that's, uh, that. yeah, it's, a, it's an unfortunate, um, you know, yeah. way of approaching things. Um, I, I get it. 
um, uh, you know, people can be very scared of them, but if you could take a second, take a deep breath and realize that, you know, I don't necessarily need to panic right away. Um, more than likely the snake is not chasing you. Like right. I'm almost scared. Like I would almost say it will never be chasing you, but I don't <laughs> want to say that because who knows? Right. Um, but you know, going the same direction it is. <laughs> yeah. It, I've had racers that are trying to like figure out what I am, uh, black racers. And they, they have this behavioral trait where they'll actually periscope. So they pick their head off the ground by about six, eight inches and they're looking at you and their eyesight's pretty good. But if they can't figure out what you are, they may come closer to take a better look at you, which would very much give the appearance of being chased. Yeah. So <laughs> I get it. Um, it's, it's, um, it's one that, you know, every situation when people encounter snakes is going to be different. Uh, my recommendation is don't panic, try to make sure you're safe and make a decision based on the best information you have. We think this website helps provide really good information to help you make that decision. Um, the better thing you can do is take a look at the website before you go hiking outside. However, um, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to make it so it's on your phone, but we're still working on that. Hey, Matt, while we have you here, you know, I've heard this rumor before that somebody was dropping rattlesnakes out of helicopters is have you ever heard that rumor you can uh, would you respond to that? <laughs> I have heard so I have heard that rumor um many times and all I want to know is who's who owns that company because they were well employed for many many years in every state I've ever lived in right. um yeah the so um there is an active rumor that DNRs, uh, Department of Natural Resources in, in most states were dropping rattlesnakes out of helicopters or airplanes. Uh, I've never heard of that being true. Uh, the only thing I've known, um, situation I've known that to be true is um, we use helicopters to catch elk. And therefore, you could see a helicopter carrying an elk over southeast Kentucky. Um, I'm but, sure is a, is a neat sight to see. <laughs> oh, it's something. And we will have it on the show. Uh, we're trying to get that footage finalized. Um, but um, the Canadian uh, government actually used uh, helicopters and airplanes to drop beavers into the boreal forest to get them um, reestablished after they were um, extirpated from trapping. So they actually dropped beavers with parachutes into lakes in the boreal like, forest. How far can you drop a beaver without was, it? <laughs> they were in a box. Say, yeah. They were in a box. There's a pair of them in a box, and it literally parachuted to the ground. It hit the ground. The box was designed to open on impact, and the beavers walked. You can YouTube this. You can look it up. Wow. There's a video of it. It's really it's and it worked incredibly well. They repopulated beavers all through the boreal forest. <laughs> well, thanks for putting to rest the rattlesnakes from um, helicopters. Remember, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yep. All right, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Great resource. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. Oh, uh, you know, Renee, we're going to be switching gears a little bit to something that's really popular every week, and um, thanks to Laurie Thomas. Definitely. All right, Lori, what's our tree of the week? Are you keeping All right, it? Our secret? tree of the week this week is bitternut hickory. It's one of the many hickories that we have in the state. And it's um, a really widespread and pretty uniformly distributed of all the hickories anyway. Um, and probably the least palatable of the nuts. So um, you'll learn some more about that. So here's the bitternut hickory. Wildlife. Yes, for or wildlife for us too. <laughs> well, or for us too. Yes, we wouldn't. It's not, not tasty. They're astringent, the nuts are. So. Okay, but here's bitternut hickory. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the bitternut hickory. Bitternut hickory, Curia cordiformis, is grouped with the pecan hickories. It is also called swamp hickory and bitternut. It is a medium to large sized tree that typically grows about 60 to 90 feet tall and 12 to 24, maybe a little bit larger in inches in diameter. In a forested setting, it develops a long, branch-free trunk that has very little taper and a rounded crown. It is generally intermediate to intolerant of shade and somewhat fast-growing. It is the shortest live of the hickories, typically living only 200 years. Bitternut hickory is probably the most abundant and uniformly distributed of the hickories. It is found throughout the eastern and midwestern forest. It can be found growing on a wide variety of sites, from rich, moist bottomlands to drier hillsides, but best growth is in moist mountain valleys. Bitternut hickory is the most prolific root and stump sprouter of the northern species of hickories, with sprouts arising from stumps, root collar, and the roots. 
The leaves of bitternut hickory are deciduous and alternately arranged on the branch. The leaves are pinnately compound and they're about 7 to 10 inches long with 7 to 11 leaflets. The leaflets are somewhat lance shaped with serrated margins and the leaf stem is slimber to moderately stout compared to other hickories and somewhat hairy. Leaves are dark green above and paler below. The buds have a sulfur yellow bud scales and are a good identifying characteristic for this tree. Fall color is an attractive and somewhat striking bronzy yellow. Bitternut hickory is monoecious, meaning one house, which means a tree has both male and female flowers. The male flowers are drooping catkins, usually in groups of three, in yellow-green, and they usually emerge before the female flowers. The female flowers are very small, only about an eighth of an inch, and they're in short spikes at the end of the twig. The flowers bloom in spring, between April and May, depending on latitude, and bitternut hickory produces a large amount of pollen, and the flowers are wind-pollinated. The fruit is a globe-shaped nut that's about one to one and a half inches long and is known for its bitter, astringent taste. The fruits are either solitary or groups of twos or threes. The husk on the nut is thin and partially splits from the tip to halfway up the nut. They are green when immature, ripening to a reddish brown, and often have a light covering of a dusty yellow. Fruit ripens in fall during one growing season, and seeds are dispersed almost exclusively by gravity, since it's not a wildlife favorite due to its bitterness. Trees don't begin seed production until about 30 years of age, with best protection between 50 and 125 years. Good seed crops are produced at three to five year intervals. Bitternut hickory is one of the tight barked hickories. It's not shaggy like shag bark or shell bark. The bark is smooth and silvery gray when young, and as it ages, the bark develops shallow furrows and interlacing ridges. The bark re resembles mockernut and pignut hickories. The wood is not equal to other hickories in terms of wood hardness and strength. The heartwood tends to be light to medium brown, sometimes with a reddish hue, and the sapwood is paler and somewhat yellowish brown. Boards with contrasting heartwood and sapwood are often called calico hickory. It is considered non-durable to perishable regarding heartwood decay. Along with other hickories, bitternut has a high thermal energy content when burned and makes a high quality firewood. Bitternut hickory does have wildlife value, but not on par with other hickories, which have more palatable fruit. Some birds and mammals do eat the nuts, but they are less favored. It is the larval host for butterflies and luna moths, and the bitternut hickory also supports the hickory horn devil larva. The wood is often lumped with other hickory wood and is used for tool handles and tools because it's shock resistant. The wood is also used for lumber, furniture, flooring, and pulp wood. And due to its high thermal energy content, it is a useful fuel wood and used for charcoal. And the wood is commonly used for smoking meats. The national champion bitternut hickory as of 2021 is in Brunswick, Virginia. It is 176 inches in circumference, 130 feet tall, with a 103 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion bitternut hickory as of 2021 is in Woodford County. It's 116 inches in circumference, 117 feet tall, with a 57 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest National Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about bitternut hickory. This tree's common name comes from the bitter nuts. The foliage of bitternut hickory has a high calcium content and is near the top of the list of soil improving tree species. Early settlers used oil from the nuts for oil lamps. Native Americans ground the nuts to make an oil. They used it as an insecticide and occasionally as a food, and they also used the wood. The scientific genus name Caria is from the Greek Caria, the name applied to the walnut tree, and the species name Cordiformis is from the Latin cordis, which means heart, and formis, which means shape, probably referring to the shape of the nut. I'm glad you joined me to learn about the bitternut hickory and get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, a local park, or neighborhood and enjoy this native hickory. Well, Lori, I'm going to be honest. We, um, we Every week we look at these and we learn something new about trees and I just love them. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Very, very good work, man. Yeah, like it. I said, I enjoy doing these. It's a, like a review every week, so it's good. <laughs> yeah. 
So how many different hickories do we have in Kentucky? We have nine different hickories in Kentucky. We have 15 in different hickories in North America in the Caria genus, and there's nine that we find here in Kentucky. So, so yeah. only those nine we find, the rest of them are throughout the United States. Right, exactly. But I mean, our think about it, our forests are, they're really classified as oak hickory forests. So we got lots of different kinds of oaks and quite a few different kinds of hickories as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason for that is because our forests are different than other forests, like say out in the Western United States. Yeah, yeah, that, yes, yeah, different. We have different um, environments, so different species do better here. Some of it um, out West, I don't know that glaciation would have been part of it, but that's why we see some differences to the North of us because of glaciation moved species down. Um, and they, uh, so yes, we have a, a, an oak hickory forest, which used to be, which I think Dr. Crocker's talked about when she talked about with American chestnut. American chestnut used to be a really big component of our forest. Mm -hmm. um, and now oaks and hickories have kind of taken some of that place since we've lost the American chestnut. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this again. We appreciate it. Yeah, All very right. good. Very good. Awesome. Oh. Speaking oh, of Dr. Crocker. Speaking of Dr. Crocker, yeah. there she is. <laughs> Did I hear my name? <laughs> hey, everyone. Nice to see you today. Thanks for having me on again. No, you, you've got a pretty interesting topic coming up for them. <laughs> start a new segment for you all, a recurring segment um, about pesky plants. So those um, invasive plants that may be a problem in your woods, maybe a problem in your backyard, depending, and certainly can go from your yard to your woods. Or vice um, versa. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, it can, they can move all around. They don't stay put, these pesky plants. Um, and so today I'm going to mention one in particular that we can expect to see popping up soon. Um, so this is something that's already there, but right now we're getting into the best time to see it. Um, and that is calorie pear. Uh, so, so I'm sure you've seen these beautiful calorie pears in bloom uh, looking like this and they look gorgeous. They're one of the first things to flower in the spring. They actually flower before they have their leaves on, they kind of leaf out right at the same time. And so it's really eye catching. Um, and that's part of their popularity, right? So calorie pears, um, there are many different cultivars of calorie pear, um, but some of the popular ones you might've seen before are things like Bradford pear. And they're really, you know, they went through a period there where they were just the plant and they were planted as street trees everywhere. Here you can see a street that's lined with them. Um, if you go to any kind of major retail store, even today, you can find them for sale. And again, they have different names. They're all sold as flowering pears um, or ornamental pears but they might, you know, come under different cultivars that each have different forms, um, different strengths and different weaknesses, but they're all in this calorie pear group. Um, and they're all the same species. Uh, and, and initially they were sold as sterile. So they produced these tiny, tiny little pears, but the seed wouldn't um, be viable. But it turns out that yes, the Bradford pear, the seed are not viable with other Bradford pears, but they certainly are with other calorie pears. And there are many of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's one of the challenges with it is that it was supposed to stay put and stay put in the landscape setting, uh, but now we see it popping up everywhere. So this is uh, an old field area uh, near Lexington, and in just a few weeks when you look out there, what you're going to see is the sea of little white flowers. And why is that a problem? You know, they look pretty, right? Why, why should we mind it? Um, these are not native here, so they're from Asia, a different part of the world, and they can really outcompete some of the native species that we want to be seeing in these areas. They grow super densely. They've got this very dense form. It's not going to allow sunlight down to the forest floor underneath them. It's going to crowd out others and just clog everything up. You want to see these areas turning into forests over time, right? We want to see our native trees coming in and growing. Uh, we don't want to see this really dense, dense stand of calorie pear um, and then underneath that calorie pear exposed soil that's going to be more susceptible to erosion and other problems and doesn't really play well with the other native plants that we want to see in that understory, be they seedlings or wildflowers, um, you know, other things that we want to see. And the other challenge with these calorie pears is that I mentioned they're really popular ornamental plants in the landscape setting, but they're not 
not the best suited to our climate. So if you're, you are the owner of a calorie pear, you might be aware of the fact that they drop branches really readily. They have this super dense growth form that results in a lot of kind of weak branch unions that either require a fair bit of pruning or is gonna be really susceptible to cracking apart if we have an ice storm, if we have kind of major weather events, um, lots of issues associated with them and they're not terribly long lived trees anyways. So because of this, I really recommend that you get familiar with them and you, instead of planting calorie pear, think about other native species that could be a better fit, not only for your yard and what you want, but for our natural areas as well. So a couple other tips on identifying uh, invasive calorie pears. So here you can see kind of as you're going to see it in just a few weeks with the flowers out and these tiny little leaves just starting to form. It's got this really dense form. So lots and lots of branches um, forms these kind of dense thickets that are hard to get through. And if we look at each of these features a little bit more, hopefully that'll help you identify it on your own property for future control. Um, so this is what it's going to look like soon. And this is the easiest time to pick it out because nothing else has leaves and nothing else is flowering, but it is. But once it has its leaves on, um, they're going to be pretty glossy and shiny. They're alternate, not opposite. Um, and they, they have this kind of, you know, distinctive uh, form in my opinion, and also tend to look very, very healthy and shiny. Um, and then they have these fruits uh, that are hard, round, tiny little pears. They almost look like tiny little apples, uh, and they're going to soften over winter and then be eaten by birds and carried elsewhere to, to make more calorie pear. Um, so they have these beautiful white flowers, but a note for anybody who's lived in a neighborhood that's been entirely planted with them, uh, they can be quite smelly when they are blooming. So they might look pretty, but uh, you know they, they come with their own drawbacks. And another drawback of calorie pear, but something that could be useful in identifying it, is that now the ornamental cultivars don't have thorns, but that wild calorie pear, once it reverts to that form, uh, has big thorns uh, that can really be a pain, literally, when you're trying to walk through areas that have a lot of calorie pear. They can even pop equipment tires, um, so be a, a headache as well. So what are my tips for managing calorie pear? First, don't plant it. I know it looks pretty. I know it has these lovely flowers, but there are lots of great native alternatives that I'd recommend. Whether we're talking about service berry, which also has beautiful flowers in the springtime. There are American plums that look really similar in their flower, in their form um, to calorie pear, but won't do the same negative things in our natural areas. If you want beautiful spring colors, check out our Eastern red bud um, or flowering dogwoods, you know, other great native species. And I know some of these have been featured in our tree of the week segments. So a lot of great resources there. Um, and, and I'd also encourage you, you know, you might find a calorie pear for sale really cheap somewhere and think, oh, this is going to be great. Um, but invest that extra money in something that you're going to be happy with long term. That's going to be a better fit for that site and for our natural areas. And then if you want to remove calorie pear, now's a great time to scout for it. Um, and if you have small trees, you might be able to pull them up entirely, getting the entire root system. This is going to be easiest when the soil is moist. Um, but for those larger trees, uh, or for those smaller trees that you can't do that with, a foliar herbicide spray could be useful. And then for those bigger trees, the medium to large trees, you probably are going to be looking at more of a cut stump herbicide approach or a basil bark herbicide approach. Um, and regardless, uh, you've got to be constantly monitoring for new arrivals, whether these are re-sprouts from that root system that you thought you got all of it, but maybe a little bit was left in there um, from the seed bank, from birds bringing them in. And right now, flowering is a great time to scout for calorie pear, but depending on what you're doing, it might not be the best time for some of those treatment approaches. So you can always flag those trees for later when they won't be in flower and they won't stick out in the same way so you remember which ones they are. Uh, so there's lots of great resources out there about calorie pear and other invasive plants from the Forest Service, and I really encourage you to check those out and refer to them. They'll give you those specifics on, you know, what to do under different conditions, the best management approaches, and uh, uh, reach out to me if you have any other questions about that, and I'll be happy to take some questions right now. 
Well, thank you, Ellen. We greatly appreciate that. And, you know, I know 25 years ago when we built our house, I was actually told to buy an aristocrat pear tree. And so we have one in our backyard and the little pears do come down and a lot of my dog will eat them and sometimes it makes her <laughs> sick, you know, because she, oh, no. she, she eats too many of them. She loves them. <laughs> um, but you're talking about the root sprouts, they're all over the place and they're, they, it's really hard to take care of that continuously. So, and, yeah. and, you know, to your kind of situation, the question I frequently get is, well, does this mean I need to cut down my, my, That's my, what I'm pear, my aristocrat? Um, and, and I would say, for 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 me, uh, I I would I would look at that tree every day and be frustrated by it if I had one in my front yard. And so I'd probably take it out and plant something else for me. But for other people, if that tree brings you joy and you are in an area where all of your neighbors already have um, these calorie pears planted, that cat is out of the bag. Um, so you know, you removing your your pear, your tree that you love. Um, might might be more negative than the positive that it brings and I would encourage you instead to think about you know future landscaping and that tree you know calorie pear are not long lived trees so think about kind of what happens next when that tree starts to fall apart. Uh, what are you going to put in there that's going to give you what you loved about that tree, whether it's the small form, the small size, or those beautiful white flowers. Um, uh, versus if you're in an area and I say that in our in our central Kentucky area that calorie pear is everywhere. Um, but if you're in an area where there's not any calorie pear, certainly don't plant, <laughs> plant new ones. You will regret it and so will your neighbors. You know, Ellen, I was thinking if they decide to leave that, that can be a great educational opportunity, right? Say, so, you know, as you have visitors come to your house and they're like, oh, what a beautiful tree. They can say, <laughs> yes, but... But <laughs> I wish I'd planted one of those natives and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't work so, in forestry at the time. Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 have, you have helped educate them. Well, and you and our them. forestry building used to have one right in our front yard. I know. Um, and it was such a great example, like you said, Billy, of kind of some of the negatives of it, because anytime we'd have a storm, a big branch would fall out of it. Um, and then that happened enough times that the tree had to be cut down. Uh, but it was always a good exhibit of like, and there it is doing what it does <laughs> falling apart in a storm um so another reason why you probably don't want it in your your yeah. landscape and during our little ice storm you know a couple weeks ago i kept going to my window and looking out and going are you still up <laughs> <You know? laughs> i thought for sure it'd be down along with my fence you know? <laughs> so. glad it was it yeah yeah and so right. ellen great series you're starting with us this is really nice I yeah mean, stay tuned for a new plan each month you know the the only thing that's a little sad is you've got so many to cover you know, <laughs> but we have so many great native species as yes, well. I Unfortunately, really like with a little bit of help, I think we can really help them um, grow vigorously and yep. uh, vibrantly into the future. Oh, you know, and I kind of like I liked what you did, you know, saying, hey, if you like this feature, then this tree will offer that because I was like, I need to remember that because eventually yeah. <laughs> the tree's coming down. And I'm gonna have to plant well, when that happens, when the time comes, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can steer you to resources. Uh, the Kentucky Native Plant Society has a great list of nurseries that carry native plants, um, as well as the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council has a great list of native alternatives to some of these invasive plants. Uh, so there's lots of good resources out there. It might require a little bit more digging than just going to the store and getting what's ever there. Um, but I think you'll be happier in the long term. Wonderful. Thank you, Ellen. We yeah. appreciate Thank you. it. Very good. Very good. Wow. Renee, another great show. You know, mm -hmm. we've covered, uh, covered a lot of ground here today. We did definitely. And, you know, every week we seem to seem to have more and more and we hope everybody just continues to join us because it's something that, uh, we were going to keep doing, even though, you know, COVID-19 hopefully is kind of, you know, dropping down a little bit. Um, but yet we still feel like this can get the word out to a lot of our, our folks and our woodland owners. Yeah. And I'll remind everybody, you know, if you're not familiar with your local county extension offices, mm -hmm. please get to know them. There's some great resources out there um, across the state of Kentucky and they want to help you. Um, so it's a great connection and they can reach all of us. Um, no problem whatsoever. We work with them on a regular basis. So um, again, Thank you all for being with us every week. We really, really appreciate it. We um, do. You know, if you've got questions, or you, we've got a little survey you can um, fill out on fromthewoodstoday.com. And, and, or if you've got ideas about future show topics, let us know there as well.
I mean, we take those all the time and we've had several shows based on, hey, have you ever thought about doing this? And I mean, I know a couple of shows from now is an, is an idea that we were asked to do. So, you know, we, we do listen to you, believe it or not. We, we will definitely take those in consideration. Um, so we really like that. Yeah. And all of these shows are recorded and available for viewing. You can visit them on our YouTube page. You can probably get to them from our Facebook page. Um, you can also um, go to fromthewoodstoday.com and we have them all archived there. And I know Renee is working on uh, making those even more robust um, with additional content. So it's a great resource. So please let others know. There's probably a lot of people out there that would um, appreciate this information. So let them know about it. Yeah, like you said, Billy, we just redid that website. And, and so now you can see every single, uh, there's, you have to scroll down at the bottom, you know, so we don't show you like 50 million videos at one time, but you can see every single one, every single show we've done. Um, so I, I know me, you know, you may, we may have done one on the spring because, you know, Billy, we are coming up on our one, an, one year anniversary almost. Know, so, soon, yeah. yeah, soon. So, you know, we might be, you know, I, they did something in the spring. What was that red bud jelly <laughs> recipe that they created? You know, it's on there. So you can you can go back and find that information. Yeah, and, and most of those topics are timeless in that regard. So definitely. All right. Well, folks, thank you all again so much. We really appreciate you all being part of this. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Yeah. Take care. Bye, everyone.